We're back from the NAM show, uh, which is in California, but for those of you who've never been or not read about it or live on the planet Zorg, uh, Sam's going to tell you a bit about what the show actually is because it's very large. So the NAM show, uh, NAM is an acronym that stands for North American Music Merchants. It is, in essence, a small city that descends on the LA suburb of Anaheim once a year and gives an opportunity for manufacturers to show off all the latest and greatest music technology. Yeah, and I think it's probably taken over from Frankfurt, in fact has many years ago, as being the show to be at. It's where most of the new products for the year tend to get launched, and even though a few are held back for the Frankfurt Music Messer and other shows, most of them, I think, try to get their new stuff ready for NAM. So as usual, there's lots of uh, exotic analogue kit at the show, but the problem with analogue has always been uh, recall, of course. And one of the trends that we're seeing now is to have uh, digitally controlled analog, sometimes with digital side chains as well, but quite often the, the main signal path is analog. Um, we saw a couple of things at this show, but probably the Mac DSP thing was the newest. Yes, so there's, there's a couple of things that have been around for a while, like a system from Bettermaker that yeah. allows you to treat their analog equaliser as a plug-in within your DAW. Mm. But the Mac DSP system was very interesting. They're calling it the APB16. Mm. It's a one new lime green rat unit it connects to your computer via Thunderbolt and it contains 16 channels of configurable analog processing. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that by sending it the right control signals, this circuitry can rearrange itself to form all manner of dynamic processors, saturation processors, transient enhancers and that kind of thing. And the side chain is digital and is sent from your computer via a separate A to D converter. So in essence, it looks to your computer like 16 channels worth of plugins mm. that you just insert on a track in Pro Tools, but internally, the processing that's taking place is actually happening in the analog domain. Mm. And that's very different from the RecFX approach, which is actually to use the original old analog kit and then stick digital actuators on the front to turn the knobs for you. Yes, sort of giving classic hardware a new lease, lease of life in the internet world. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, that means you can send your files over, process it, do the controls from your end via a piece of software, and get your file back processed through the real antique gear. As long as someone else doesn't send their file at the same time. <laughs> yeah, otherwise there'll be a big queue waiting for I'm it. I'm sure they've thought of that, Yeah, haven't they? So, of course, in this day and age, we're all recording sound onto our computers. Yeah. At least I am, and you are, yeah. and probably 99% of sound on sound readers are. That means there's always a healthy crop of new audio interfaces at a trade show like NAMM. Um, one trend we spotted this year is uh, audio interfaces that specifically cater to guitarists, and you had a look at a couple of interesting products in that line, Paul. Yeah. I mean, for years we've had interfaces with a generic high impedance input into which you can plug a guitar or a bass, but there are a couple with more dedicated guitar features have come out to try and woo guitarists into the world of technology. And I think the Audient Sono is probably the most uh, technically impressive of those because it combines a valve preamp with some DSP tone stack. It's got overdrive, it's got cabinet modeling from two notes, and it also functions as a regular interface. And it's all controlled by a piece of software that looks a bit like a plug-in, but it's actually just a standalone control panel so that you can tweak all the pieces inside the software without having millions of knobs all over the front panel. So um, I'm quite looking forward to getting my hands on one of those. And then there was the Axio from IK Multimedia, which is not quite so fancy, but it does have a variable input impedance so that you can get your guitar pickups into that sweet spot where they're very happy, and guitar players know all about that. Excellent. Well, it's nice to see guitarists being catered for. Yeah, what else did you find, though? I think you looked at the more normal interfaces and found a few worth mentioning. Yes, certainly some interesting product launches at NAMM. So one of them was uh, PreSonus's Quantum 4848, yeah. which is a simple but a very, very useful thing that offers you 32 line level inputs and outputs in a very small rack mounted interface. Yeah. So perfect if you want to interface with an analog console yeah. or you have a lot of outboard, something like that. That's right, and up to 16 channels of ADAT on top of that, hence the 48. Yeah. Yes, they can count. <laughs> we can count sometimes. And um, while we're in the world of high-end interfaces, I also had a look at a very intriguing product from Steinberg called the AXR4. 
Now we know Steinberg as makers of software, obviously, and also of desktop interfaces. Mm. But the AXR4 is a bit of a departure because it's very much a high-end interface. It's got um, four mic preamps with technology license from Rupert Neve Designs that allows you to sort of overdrive input transformers to get a bit of flavor into your mic mm. signals. But it's also got a lot of high-end features like 16 channels of AES3 input and output and promises incredibly high sound quality. So that would be an interesting product, I think. That's another Thunderbolt interface. And then back in the world of USB, a couple of years ago I reviewed Arturia's Audio Fuse, which was their first audio interface. And that was a very interesting product because it was very much a sort of Swiss Army knife product, a little thing that sat on your desk, did absolutely everything, it had mic preamps, it had digital I.O., even had a turntable input. They've rethought their audio interface line this year, and they've come up with a couple of very interesting looking products, one of which is a sort of successor to the original audio fuse, or a sort of larger, expanded version of it. And the other one is a much simpler interface designed for band recording, which offers eight channels of very high spec mm. mic preamplification, ADAT input and output, that sort of thing. And you can use it either as an audio interface or as an ADAT expander. Okay. And at the other end of the scale, I did notice something from ESI. They've got quite a lot of different interfaces, but they've actually come up with some tiny ones about the size of a pack of cards with phono outputs on them, multi-channel phono outputs, so that you can just use it to feed a surround sound rig from your laptop without any kind of complication. That was quite neat. So not only are we all recording sound to our computers, but a lot of us are generating sounds within our computers, thanks to the proliferation of software instruments. I didn't manage to see a single one of them at NAMM. Paul, you had better luck, I gather. Yeah, actually, there are loads and loads of software instruments out there now. Uh, some really quite intriguing ones, but the biggies at NAMM, I think, were the Spectrosonics upgrade to Omnisphere, which gives it fancy new arpeggiator features, but also the ability to be controlled from your old analog synth. And it has a library of um, profiles, if you like, in there, so that it knows what the controls do and maps them to the nearest function in Omnisphere. So if you've got an LF, LFO control or a filter control or, or whatever, it'll actually control it directly without you having to map anything. Uh, like you say, um, it's an odd thing to do because back in the day we were doing the exact opposite, weren't we? Well, I was going to say, when I joined Sound on Sound 20 years ago, the big trend then was for products like eMagic Sound Diver, which gave you software control over the synths that never quite had enough physical controls on them. So it's yeah. interesting to see people now using those very limited physical instruments as control surfaces for software. Yeah, it is. Now, it must be stressed that most of these don't give you the sound of the original instrument, but they give you something that's in the same kind of genre, apart from the D50, which has got a lot of the original sounds in because Eric created those and apparently still has the rights to use them. Cool. Yeah. The other thing was ToonTrack. They did this thing called Easy Bass, and they made us sign our lives away, not to reveal it until the following Saturday. And at first we thought, well, bass accompaniment can't be that exciting, you know. But actually it was. It's, it's got all the different articulations of a good bass player, sample, sampled bass. Um, you put in your own song, it analyzes the musical content of it, it knows what notes you're playing, it knows what the chord changes are, it knows what the rhythm is, and it just plays really good bass along with it that sounds like a real bass player. Uh, there must be a lot more work to do on it because it won't be available till Q3 of the year, but the demo that we had, um, both myself and Dave Lockwood were more than impressed, and Dave is a very capable bass player himself. Impressive, and possibly more intelligent than some human bass players. You're not allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all working in digital studios these days, um, but that doesn't mean we're not using hardware music making equipment, and there was a lot mm. of interesting new stuff on show at NAMM this year in that department, a lot of fun looking instruments. Um, you got your hands on a couple of cool things. Yeah, I had a look at the uh, Alesis Multipad Strike, which at first glance was a bit like a Roland SPD in terms of layout. You got six square pads and then three little bars at the top that you hit. And I thought, you know, is it just a cheap clone of that? But actually, no, it's, it's taken the idea and run with it a little bit. So it's got um, coloured LEDs underneath the various pads, which you can assign colours to to tell you what the pad's doing, whether it's playing a loop or whether it's a single shot, whether the loop's actually playing, whether the loop's finished. 
It's got the ability to load in lots and lots of samples from a thumb drive, which you just plug straight into a USB port on the back, so you don't have to use a computer to do anything clever with it. And it comes with a really wide range of actually very usable presets, lots and lots of kits, and some quite melodic things as well. So I'm tempted to buy one of those. That's one of the few products that I have my credit card trying to levitate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds very useful because it's nice to have a bit of visual feedback from something like that so that you know that when you hit it, it is actually going to make a sound. Yes. And you're not going to look silly on stage. That's true. And the other thing I saw in the in music booth, which is where Alesis were hanging out, was the uh, Akai Force. Now, there's been a lot of talk about this, and I know that we were sent lots of details in advance and we had to sign our life away to say that we wouldn't mention it ever, ever to anybody until now. So now we can talk about it. It takes the MPC idea and kind of extends it to make it into a performance instrument, a recording door, if you like, almost like a door, in the, in the kind of Ableton style, the spreadsheet kind of a door. Uh, it's got coloured pads on it, which can again be programmed to do different colours for different things. It's a performance instrument, it's a loop playback instrument, it's a recording station. It does pretty much everything that you'd want to do to create music without having to go near a computer. Sounds fun. And great for live performance too. So what did you see in the more traditional sort of keyboardy sense of things? <laughs> well, the most traditional keyboardy thing that I saw, which I thought was very impressive actually, was Yamaha's new range of stage pianos, which mm. is called the CP series. Obviously making a nod there to their heritage of the CP70 and CP80. Yeah. Um, the new ones have, as far as I could tell, as a not, not much of a keyboard player, a lovely keyboard action, mm. um, really good range of classic piano and electronic mm. keyboard sounds, very easy to use, very easy to switch between them, just pretty much what you want in mm. a stage piano, so I think those will be a hit. The other thing I saw that sort of had a keyboard was the Arturia Micro Freak. Okay. Very interesting little instrument, that. Um, Arturia, of course, make the Micro Brute and the Mini Brute, and probably all sorts of other brutes that I haven't come across yet, which are conventional analog synthesizers. The Micro Freak is a bit different, actually. It has a digital oscillator, and then it runs through an analog filter seems capable of creating some really crazy sounds. And it also has an interesting control mechanism, which looks a little like a keyboard. It's laid out like a keyboard, but it's actually sort of bare PCB wires. Mm. And it can sense how much of your finger is touching the key at any one mm. time. And this gives you something a little bit like polyphonic aftertouch to work with. Yeah. So it's almost like a, a touch it theremin kind of interface. Yes, well, it remains to be seen what you can do with it, but it, I'm <clears> sure <throat> there's some pretty creative <throat> and expressive possibilities opening up there. Yeah. So uh, one of the coolest things I mm. saw was the electron model samples. Mm. Now, I've come across a fair bit of electron gear in my time at SOS. It always looks amazing, sounds incredible, leaves me wondering how on earth you use it. The electron model samples is a bit of a departure in that it's greatly simplified in terms of the user interface. So it's a small portable drum machine that behaves much like most drum machines, still does all the cool electron weirdness, mm. but looks like you could actually just get it out of the box, program up a beat and go. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on one of those. Yeah, I took a look at the demo of that. Uh, the sounds are quite interesting because they're not like your usual TR electronic drum sounds. They're, they're quite electronic. In fact, uh, as I said earlier, I think one of them sounded a bit like someone attacking a giant frog with a taser, you know, that kind of electric, almost voice-like sound that you get out of it. That's my kind of a drum machine. Yeah, very undrum-like in many ways. Uh, so I think that's going to be going to be a winner. And it does have a lot of direct access controls on the top, so you're not fighting through menus all the time. Absolutely. And also in the Swedish musical instrument trade delegation, there was a, a party from Teenage Engineering who took us off to a hotel room and showed us their new modular system. Now, a couple of years ago, Teenage Engineering launched their pocket operator hmm. instruments, which are an interesting concept because they're designed to be very, very affordable and to offer a very easy way into electronic music. Hmm. And the modular system takes that uh, philosophy to a new level, really. So it comes as a kit. It looks like it's made out of Meccano. Yeah. It's all primary colours. Beautiful industrial design. Can be interfaced with a Eurorack modular, but is also capable of operating as a standalone system. 
and yeah, it contains all the basic building blocks of a modular synth. So you've got oscillators, filters, VCAs, you've got a couple of different sequencer options or a little mini keyboard, but it's going to be incredibly affordable and a really great route into electronic music production, I think, for a lot of people. So do you have to solder the kits together or do they come as ready-made circuit boards as far as you can see? Oh, I think you just snap them together and plug in the wires. Yeah, sounds instant gratification, I like that. Mm. So now is usually a time when we see a lot of new upgrades to door software and we were hoping that Apple would show up again and show us something new about Logic and maybe GarageBand, but they didn't. So obviously they're going to be releasing something later in the year, or hopefully. But you saw some updates to things that actually were updated. I did. Um, obviously we had Cubase 10 released late last year, yeah. so not much further development on that <coughs> front. Nothing earth-shaking from Avid, but from Motu we had Digital Performer 10, the major headline feature in DP10 being the addition of a clip launching window, yeah, somewhat, somewhat like looked Ableton good. Live, which looked very well featured and very well thought out, so that should make it appeal to a whole new sort of potential user base that don't use it currently. Elsewhere in that sphere, the other major product launch I saw was Bitwig Studio 3. Mm. Bitwig's a very elegant DAW, does things a little differently from most of the others. And the major new feature in version 3 is the introduction of a complete modular processing and synthesis environment, somewhat like having Reactor or Max within Bitwig, which looks very interesting indeed. And I'm sure it opens up all sorts of experimental sound mm. possibilities. And uh, you've been exploring some experimental sound possibilities Yes, uh, I had a look at uh, Zynaptic's update of the Orange Vocoder. It, it sounds very impressive, but they keep finding things they want to improve on it so that it's not ready yet. Uh, the other news was that Golfos is now available for the PC as well as for Apple Mac, and that will please a lot of people. Now, that's quite a good Make It Sound Better plugin, which got Dave Lockwood's uh, award for this time around. Essentially, it can highlight what your mix needs more of in terms of things that are getting buried and also things that are over dominant in terms of resonances and things so that you can pull down the unwanted stuff and bring up the wanted stuff and actually make it sound a little bit clearer. And you've also been, uh, you also had a look at the latest in Waves' series of uh, celebrity plugins which is called CLA Mix Hub. Yes, that's based on the setup that Chris Lord Algae uses. Uh, it's essentially uh, buckets of eight channels of a British console. Uh, you can have a maximum of 64 showing at any one time. And it includes the hardware emulations of other parts of his processing chain as well. Uh, the big news about that is that the single plugin will show you the entire mixer and you can go directly to the controls on the mixer rather than having to, for example, open separate EQ plugins on different tracks to uh, adjust things. So it's a workflow enhancement in many ways rather than a new concept in Sonics. That's a good idea because it is a limitation of some DAWs that you can't just dive in and tweak the EQ across multiple tracks at once. You have to open up a plug-in window every time you want to make a change. So it'll be interesting to see what difference that makes to our mixing process. Yeah, I think it'll be well received. As usual, there were loads of monitors at the show. Um, one of the themes, of course, was a lot of them have got built-in room correction now. And the first one I saw was the one from IK Multimedia, which is an update of their iLoud speaker, uh, a second bigger version with two bass mid drivers in it. And they're still quite small and a centrally mounted tweeter. And it comes with a simplified version of their ARC system, but it's built in on the DSP and the speaker, so you don't have to run separate software to, to use it. And they give you a measurement mic with the speakers. So you put the measurement mic where you sit, it just runs one simple scan from that location and then it corrects the speakers. Um, they sounded pretty impressive actually for the size. But I believe you've seen a lot of bigger speakers, more grown up speakers with that kind of thing. <laughs> well, I certainly saw some big speakers. The biggest speakers I saw, the biggest new ones anyway, were the Focal um, Trio 11 BEs. I have to look at that every time I read it out. Yeah, the BEs for beryllium, of course. Which are enormous things that you're slightly scared to stand in front of because you think you might melt. Yeah. Um, and they certainly go very, very loud indeed. Mm. Those are obviously a premium sort of mid midfield monitors designed for large studios. Um, in the more project studio end of things, I also saw an interesting announcement from Adam Audio, which is that they've teamed up with Sonarworks. Mm. So rather than developing their own room correction system, 
Adam Audio will be building in Sonarworks' system. Presumably this means it will actually be available on DSP within the monitors, rather like you were describing with the IKs, yeah. so that you don't need to run Sonarworks as a plugin if you have these new Adam monitors. So that's an interesting development. But then the other big monitor launch at the show that I saw was almost taking things in the opposite direction, which was Dyn Audio's new core series of monitors. Mm. Now, Dyn Audio have had room correction in their monitors mm. for a long time, but actually in these new Core 7 and Core 59 speakers, mm. they've still got DSP in, but they've moved away from full-on room correction because their own research told them that their users weren't actually using it. Mm. They found it too complicated, too difficult to set up, and they left it switched off most of the time. So rather than give people the full facility to measure the fre frequency response of the listening position and so on, in these new speakers, they've greatly simplified what the DSP does. Mm. And so it just gives you the option to correct for various common placements, such as on a table or on the back of a console or against a wall or whatever. <laughs> and um, from what I heard, the new Core Series monitors sound great. So looking forward to hearing those in a slightly more controlled environment than the floor of an enormous barn in Los Angeles. Indeed. So as you might expect, there were loads of new microphones at the show. A few of them stood out, uh, some because of their price, some because of their lack of price, and some because of their quirky construction. Uh, probably the most unusual one was from our friends at Aston, who brought out the Stealth microphone, which is actually a very large dynamic microphone, um, but what's different about it is that it's an active dynamic mic, so it includes a preamplifier which takes the gain up considerably and makes it much more sensitive. And it's also got voicing switches in it, which you can use in both the passive and the active mode to give it several different flavours, so it, it's a bit like having a microphone that may be suitable for a lady with a high voice, may be suitable for a chappy with a deep voice, another one might be uh, warmer, suitable for making it a guitar amplifier. So uh, I look forward to trying one of those. I haven't had my hands on it yet. Yeah, sounds intriguing. It is. The other one was from Blue Microphones. And what was intriguing about this one is probably the price. It's one of their capacitor microphones. It, it works as well as you would expect a Blue Mic to work. Uh, it's called the Ember and it's only $99, which is a really good price for a, a very decent microphone. But you saw a load more, didn't you? Yes, well, on the subject of USB microphones, I mean, normally I think most of us associate USB microphones with the cheap and fairly cheerful end of the market. Um, but Antelope Audio were showing a thing called the Edge USB. Now, Antelope Audio make quite a range now of modelling microphones, mm -hmm. and the Edge USB is, as far as I'm aware, the first USB modelling microphone. So it's a USB microphone that, in theory, can be... a U47 or a C12 or an SM57 or whatever you want it to be. Ish. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam, I believe that Telefunken had some new microphones or at least updates on existing microphones. That's right. They've um, rebranded their higher end microphones as the Alchemy series. Nothing earth shattering in terms of design changes. I think they didn't fix them because they weren't broken, but um, very look great. They have changed the head baskets and various other aspects of the construction of the microphones and you now get a really nice case and a really nice package of accessories with them. So those look excellent value for money. One very interesting mic I saw was I'm a big fan of Samar microphones, which are made by Mark Fuchsman. Um, he's a boutique mic manufacturer from Salt Lake City and makes amazing ribbon microphones. Mm. Now, his high-end ribbon microphones are incredible, partly because they have an extended frequency response that goes well above 20 kilohertz. But at the NAMM show, he was showing a prototype of a new, much more affordable ribbon mic, which he thinks he can bring to market for under $400. Mm -hmm. And uh, unlike his uh, expensive ribbon mics, this is a short ribbon model, sort of somewhat in the vein of the Bayer M130. Mm. Um, so I'm really looking forward to see what he can do with this technology. Yeah, especially at that price point. Absolutely. So Sam, I believe you saw some other microphones which have a kind of LED added into them. Is, it, is this some kind of fashion statement that's happening? Well, it's happening at all sectors of the market. <laughs> so we saw some very nice microphones, which are, have been around for a few years, but we've not yet ha haven't made their way over the Atlantic yet from a company called Cathedral Pipes 
all mm. handmade in the United States, including the capsules, um, valve microphones, look lovely, have uh, lots of white LEDs in them, so you know they're there and you don't trip over them by accident. They were also showing an incredible looking mic preamp, which sort of resembled a futuristic car. Yeah. And uh, is uh, apparently based on one of the EMI uh, Abbey Road mic preamp designs. And that should be very tasty. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we also saw the MXL 990 Blaze, um, which was advertised with lots of uh, euphemisms about warmth and yeah, of course. heat. And um, is an MXL 990 with a red LED in it. <laughs> and then finally, uh, we went to the Sennheiser Neumann booth. Didn't see any new microphones, but we did see the Neumann headphones, which is an interesting development. Mm. Um, and apparently not uh, just a rebadged pair of Sennheisers, but a completely mm. new design developed by Neumann themselves independently. Mm -hmm. And we'll sit slightly above the Sennheiser closed back phones, so coming in at $500 or so. But uh, yeah, those look very interesting indeed. Mm, that's good. At the opposite end of the scale, of course, um, Mackie actually came out with a couple of pair of closed back headphones, which are around the 50 or 60 pound price mark. And I thought they sounded surprisingly good. We've got a review coming up soon, but most impressive. I wasn't expecting that from such a, an inexpensive pair of headphones. It's amazing what you can get for your money these days. It is. So as you can see from my little studio here, I gave up using mixing consoles quite a long time ago. But um, Sam saw quite a lot of consoles at the show, so clearly some people are still hanging on to this sort of antique notion of mixing. <laughs> Well, there's still a mar clearly a market, yeah, for hardware consoles. Um, some of them are more antique than others, though. Yeah. Um, some of them perhaps best are described as classic. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, in the classic vein, uh, Trident Audio launched two new consoles, the mm. 68 and 88, which, again, not sort of radically different from previous consoles, mm. but all the features you come to expect from a mid-range console um, was very easy connectivity because all the I.O. is on DB25 connectors, so yeah. you can just plug in a patch bay and away you go. And uh, talking of things classic, it would be remiss of us not to mention API. This year is their 50th birthday, which is a pretty yeah. amazing achievement in this industry. So, so nice. happy birthday, API. They were celebrating with an updated version of their The Box console, which yeah. now has complete 500 series signal path. They were also showing some limited edition sort of anniversary recreations of classic API modules, which look very nice. Mm -hmm. And yeah, here's to another 50 years of API. And finally, Loop Trotter had an interesting modular console that also can accept 500 series modules. So that offers a lot of potential. So that's it, another NAMM show over. Time for the ears to recover. The guitar hall was rather like having your head in a cement mixer full of old guitar parts. You know, it was a really noisy show, but there were some interesting things that we didn't have time to mention, like there's new guitar pedals which do processes that you may not find in plugins. There were lots of new and weird guitars, and of course, if you went down to the basement, Hall E, which is where all the startup companies uh, appear, you find all kinds of things that are never going to make it. <laughs> what did you see? Anything down there? No, well, and the other thing that happens at NAMM, yeah. though, which I'm sure you experienced as well, is that people take you aside into little booths and say, we're not showing this publicly, but I wanted you to have a look at this. Yes. And then we can't talk about it. Yeah, I saw several so, of those. I can't tell you about them, but they were amazing. They will revolutionise your life. They've already revolutionised our life, but we but can't sadly, tell you we about had them. to sign the NDA and we can't tell you anything about them. <laughs> Until next year. <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it, and subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.